radio commentator and a co-sponsor of the Juliet Central Black School Teachers Union. How many of y'all are familiar with that? Okay. Uh, as an educator, he was voted most inspiring teacher three times, awarded the Juliet Chamber of Commerce Great Teacher Award in 2017 and the National Hookup of Black Women Gold Star Award for Education in 2018. As a speaker, he has been featured in, I'm sorry, had various engagements in a multitude of educational institutions from Illinois State University to the University of St. Francis and Joliet Junior College. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to your speaker, Ernest Kramer. is you can always highlight the good things about your life and you can make yourself sound real good. When somebody asks for your bio, the first thing you do is you look at all the good things in your life, you know? And the thing about that is, there's a lot of bad things that we don't really highlight. Like, I don't really talk about the fact in my bio that I almost flunked out of school. Well, I don't always mention that there were various times in my life where I didn't realize or even know if I was gonna make it to the next day, you know? So today, what I really wanna talk about and hone in on is the things that happen in between that bio that we don't really mention. And for the purpose of today, I'm going to use one of my new favorite movies. I'm not sure how many of y'all have ever seen this movie, Black Panther. Make some noise if you've seen that movie. I think the better thing to say would probably be, make some noise if you didn't see that movie. Because really, what was you doing the past year? Everybody has seen that. And if you did, just keep your hands down. We ain't going to embarrass you, all right? So that's going to be the focal point of today. So I'm glad that everybody has seen it because some of the references I'm going to make, I'm going to have some clips. But by and large, I want to be able to say things that you all recognize. And of course, I don't want to give any spoilers out so everybody's on the same page, right? So uh, I want to do, I want y'all to do me a favor real quick because I'm a teacher by trade. So I like for my students to discuss things. So the first thing I want you all to turn to your neighbor and talk about is who is your favorite superhero and why? Talk to somebody next to you. Introduce yourself to your home. Who's your favorite superhero and why? I'm tricking up, be honest. 
Can I be open with y'all without y'all laughing at me? So I'm an 80s baby, okay? Y'all some 2000s, 9-11s around that time period, baby, you know? So our, we grew up in a different era. Black Panther had a comic book, but I didn't read comic books. I just like cartoons. So my guy, I want to say my number one, Spider-Man. Who said a lot? And I got an answer for you. Spider-Man was number one because, of course, I was young. Spider-Man was young. He was in high school. He was a regular dude. Like, he didn't seem, to me, most of these superheroes I don't like because they, they seem like he couldn't really be a person. You know, like, it seemed like it really couldn't happen. But besides the web coming out of his hand, some of that stuff seemed kind of realistic, you know? And I felt like I could relate to him. I was a shy dude. He was a shy dude. And he, and he got something that made him come out of his shell. So I felt that was relatable. I thought it was cool. My number two, Wolverine. Y'all probably never seen that version, that X-Men version right there. Y'all know, know the movie. They come out with too many of them. Again, relatable. Besides, like, the claws, that whole little thing. But he wasn't flying around. He was a regular dude to me. And somebody captured him. I like the story. And they were doing an experiment on him. And you know what's interesting about that? He wasn't black, but what's relatable to that is, in black history, you know what America has done to us sometimes? Experiments on us. Because he simply is experiment for one. I just read a story the other day about Fannie Lou Hamer who risked her life to register voters in Mississippi. And when she went to the hospital one time to get a tumor removed, they sterilized her out of And that was in the 60s. That was in uh, this lifetime. But Wolverine was relatable to me for that reason. Then I like Batman too, again, just relatable. As a matter of fact, he ain't got no superpowers. Ain't he like black belt, third degree? Yeah. He just whoopy, like he just rich. And the thing about it is, not only is he rich, he used his money to help people. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Like he built the suit. They still ain't like him though. And his voice got super deep when he put on the suit. I don't know how. Alright, now, now I'm taking it a little bit back with this. The Ninja Turtles. I know that's, I know that's someone that don't belong. And then I got that picture for a reason, because that was like one of the first ones. That and I forgot the power rings, man, because that was like when I was five. And they had to have a black ranger, Zach. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> My boy was Zach and uh, Tommy. I think Tommy was the green and white ranger. Uh, yeah, so that was my stuff right there. And here's how, here's how intense it was for me. And that's how I know we need to see things that look like us. When I was growing up, when I tried to be Superman, because he was one of the first ones, I didn't really rock with him. I mean, he like, took his glasses off. Like, come on, dude. He was just, so nobody know what to do with huh? Nobody knew he was far from kid working at whatever it was, the Daily Bugle or something. And he just didn't seem realistic, but they pushed him down our throat. So I would take my towel, right, when I was growing up. Saturday morning, I put a towel around my neck. I'm going around the house doing this stuff. And I'm Superman. That image was important to me. When I wanted to be Wolverine, you know what I did? Oh, no, no, I ain't gonna <laughs> My mom would have been tripping over. I took some pictures. <laughs> and I walk around the house like this, you know what I'm saying? Um, and then for the Ninja Turtles, you ain't gonna never guess what I did for this. I put the book bag on. They only peep that. What's the book bag for? Shell. Boy, I was creative. <laughs> you said, not really. <laughs> ain't none of y'all thinking that, though. See? See, the point I'm trying to make is before you can even admire the greatest of all time, like Michael Jordan, you know, or an athlete, or, or anybody else that is like a human being, we see cartoons versus kids. And they say that your brain is most malleable. Y'all know what that word means? Malleable in the first five years of your life. So that means that the knowledge you get within the first five years or the habits you obtain in the first five years will be things that stick with you for life. And they'll be implanted in your subconscious. So you speak English, right? You get up, you, you go brush your teeth. You walk, you don't think about it, you just do it. That's why it's easiest to teach a kid a new, a new language in the first five years. Your brain is being molded. So these images are very important to us. I didn't see a black parent, but you all did. And why does this image even matter? Because if we take it to real life, because when I grow up and I start to look for things, people who look like me, or maybe I say real life superhero, because that's part of the reason why I chose to be a teacher. Because I felt like that was my way of being a real life superhero. Every day I'm with kids that look like me. Every day I can help them out. Because I mean, I ain't got that much money to buy a suit like that. So I had to find a different way. 
like, oh, you're like, what is this, Krim? So what I'm trying to tell you all is the things you see and the things you look at eventually will become you. They'll become a part of you. You know what you look like, but guess what? Yeah, you didn't probably even think of it, but you don't look at yourself all day. Unless you, you know, do that thing. You might take something out there, I don't know. But you don't. You look at other people. As a matter of fact, you look for reflections of yourself in other people. So your best friend, your girl, or whatever. You chose them, they chose you because you felt they reflect what you like, what value in a person. So if we always see things that don't look like us, then what will we probably emulate? People that don't look like us and we'll pick up different values that aren't really accustomed to us. So I want to show you how important it is to value things in life. I want you to stare at this rainbow, particularly stare at the dot. I want you to stare at it for, let's say, 20 seconds. When you finish, I want you to look at the white wall. I want you to tell me what you see. Let me cap. Well, I'll cap. sure it's a valid source, but I said, why does your brain blah, blah, blah. And it's something called negative retinal display. It means that your retina can only absorb a certain amount of colors or images at a given period of time. And when it's overexposed, it sees it, even though you're not really looking at it anymore. So what does that let you even know about your sight? Your physical sight is a illusion. It's an illusion. You see things that aren't really here. Think about everything that exists in this room that you can't see. If you saw how many germs are on your desk, you probably wouldn't want to touch it again. <laughs> Being real, you're probably one of them neat freaks for real. You'll probably walk around with some hand sanitizer, getting everybody one of these. Maybe not even one of those. Maybe an air deck. It's real. It's a bunch of stuff. So what that means for you is, if you don't overexpose yourself to positive images then you probably be less likely to replicate. You see what I'm saying? Because if we think about our existence as black men in this world, we're overexposed to people who achieve the highest point of success in athletics or entertainment, or maybe prison lifestyle, game lifestyle. But this is what we don't see. We have 13% of the population, 6% black men. 1.7% of teachers are black men. Think about how many black male teachers you got at your school right now. They're in the room, essentially. <laughs> we in the room. We took them all today. Julian West probably might, might be too. Shout out to Mr. Thompson in the back. <laughs> so think about this, and, and this was a deciding factor when I, when I became a teacher. Because I remember being in between like careers in college, and I remember like almost flunking out and not knowing what I wanted to do. And I would talk to my dad and talk to different people and take different history courses, and teaching came up. And I never thought, I, I never knew anybody that wanted to be a teacher from like being 10 or 15, maybe a lady or something, but not a guy. I didn't think that was really a career for me. But what it got to me was I wanted to make a difference. And I realized that if you at home with your parents, where do you go right after that? School. So who you with all day? Your teachers, right? If you want to class. You with your teachers every day. We talking six through eighteen. They gonna have the biggest impact. As a matter of fact, if your parents got a work schedule that's off track with your school schedule, then who you gonna see more? And then your coaches. So it becomes a family. So I'm like, man, if I want to make an impact, I gotta be in there with these kids every day. Two percent. They trying to pay y'all to go to school and teach. A lot of us ain't taking off, but they want to pay for your whole school. And you get to come back and go into a classroom 
kick it with some kids, some people that are younger than you that's going to keep you young <laughs> and teach a course you like. And if you don't like class, go to PE. You, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? There are so many options out there. We need y'all. Then look at lawyers. Everybody might need a lawyer. They might even talk about getting in trouble with something. They could just be to defend yourself or something. 3%. All the law firms we got in downtown is only getting 3%. Doctors, 4%. Now, I'll tell you this. Look, I always see, uh, I, I like to think I can still move a little bit. And I played in the staff and uh, staff and staff game last semester, right? And, you know, I was doing my thing, doing a little something, something, you know. But I, I ran into a couple hard picks, right? I ain't thinking nothing of it. I'm running into some of these big security guards. You know how security guards are essential. I even was kind of swollen. And later that night, I'm eating some pizza, and I'm lifting up the pizza, and all of a sudden, I can't lift my arm no more. You know, I ain't think nothing of it. I'm like, okay, just move, bro. Take it around. The next morning, I wake up. I come with my arm past me. It's like last November. So I'm like, okay, this is going to be cool. I never, I never had an injury like that. Now, boy, from high school and everything. Um, later that day, it was, it was done. Couldn't do anything. That was Saturday. Sunday, I went to the ER. Found that I had a torn rotator cuff. Had to get an arm sling, all of that. But the point is, the person who met me in the room was a black doctor with dreads. And I was like, <laughs> and then, I was like, this dude, I ain't saying nothing to him at first. I was like, I got a black doctor. I've never had a black doctor in my life. I'm like, this is pretty cool. Dude with dreads about this long, like all the way to his knees, too. I'm like, man, I'm really kind of got a light up here. And as I was leaving, I was walking around, kids, you know, I'm like, man, I got to see what this dude is. So I walked back. And I was like, bro, are you a family physician? I was dead serious. I, I don't even go to the doctor, really. I was going to change who my family doctor was so I could have that dude. Because imagine me having him as a doctor, and I got to take my kid in, and the first image my kid see as a professional, as a doctor, is a black man. And then what might they want to be? What if I have a son? They see that, black man. That's powerful. But what we often see, y'all, is this. Look, 6% of the population 40% of the prison population. How did that math even work out? I want you to think about this for a second. What was the prison population during slavery? There was none. We were doing the work during slavery that they have us doing now when they locked us up. The 13th Amendment, if you ain't seen a documentary yet on Netflix, it says that slavery is over except if you're found guilty of a crime. Think about your neighborhood. Think about your community. Everything we do in our neighborhood is being a crime now. When I was growing up, if you hanging out outside on the corner, you're loitering. That's a crime. You, you walk across the street, and the light is red still. Jaywalking, that's a crime. Mike Brown, right? See, we have to be so aware of what these traps they have set out for us that we can step over and move out. Y'all know what a landmine is? They got landmines set up in the hood. Booby traps that we can't see, but we're not aware of. So we step on them. We sink and we do it. But what education does for you, knowing about yourself, what that does for you is you go outside of your neighborhood. You see it, you step around, now we got to detonate, detonate that. You see what I'm saying? That's what education is. That's by design. You don't have that like this unless it's purposeful. Same thing with this. What happened to the baseball fields in our neighborhood? I love playing baseball growing up, but there was nowhere for me to go and play on actual field. You see what I'm saying? Like, we can do that stuff. It's just we're not exposed to it. You will excel in whatever you are overexposed to. I did about all of this growing up, except for that. Hooped. Played football back in high school on the block. Just anybody play tackle? Like, yeah, concrete. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> Trying to be Randy Moss and all that. And Barry Sanders, Walter Payne, Rabbit. Tried that too in college and all of that. But I didn't say that was my end be all, right? But that's what we see. But then think about this one. My, my, my hip hop fans, as a matter of fact, hip hop fans. All right. I want you to think about this. Maybe you don't know, but I'll tell it to you. The wealthiest rappers. Can you name anyone? Jay Z. P. Diddy. Who else? Amen. He's somewhere on there. Kanye, <laughs> somewhere on there. Rick Ross on there. Top, top three, Jay-Z, or it might be actually Diddy, Jay-Z, Dr. Dre. Two of them never rode around in their life. One of them doesn't have to ride around ever again in his life. He made most of his money outside of rap. Matter of fact, one of the top rappers out now, he's the one who signed him, J. Cole, right? You see what I'm saying? Like, the money and all of this stuff is not in the people you see, it's behind the scenes. 
prison population. But we know we ain't making no money off that because they pay you a few cents an hour. The company, they got private prisons you can buy stock in yep. that they put in your neighborhood. And then they pass laws to lock you up more. You see what I'm saying? It's a truck that set up, y'all. They make the money, the politicians, the people who own the companies. If LeBron is making, I don't know, what do you make, about 100 million a year now? I don't know, 50 million? Think about the dude who signs the contract. I remember when Chris Rock said that one time, he was like, no, Shaq ain't rich. I mean, I'm sorry, Shaq ain't wealthy, he rich. The dude who signed his check is wealthy. If I can sign your check for 50 million a year, I gotta be having about at least 10 times that, at least. We trying to own the team, y'all. We ain't trying to just play. Play if you're good, but then get an ownership. Think about the comparison, 74%. How many black owners, though? Michael Jordan? What well, used to, he sold his stock in Morgan and other next year, he sold his stock. So we talked to Jay-Z, and I think it might be one other guy. That's a lady, too? Okay, Magic Johnson, too. He back in ownership? Okay. So it might be three. And then check it out. Two of these three, then, will be former basketball players. Most of the owners, probably in the NBA, the white guys, didn't play ball. So there's a big gap. You see what I'm saying, y'all? You don't just play. When you playing, how can I own it? You work for somebody who's a small business owner, what's your day like? How you get involved in it? Y'all don't even pick, man. For my people that's in my school, whenever I bring a speaker in, I'm talking to them on the side. How you do that? How you start your business? I bring them in so y'all can learn from them, but I'm also trying to learn too. I didn't grow up learning how to open up a business or company. My, the, I was molded to go to college. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's what my, my parents were taught. But entrepreneurship, that's the new way, the new old way. Black Wall Street, y'all, Ever heard of that? Black Wall, anybody, put your hand up. Black Wall Street was one of the most profitable black, I'm sorry, American business districts in the country, especially in Oklahoma. And it got burnt down 100 years ago. And we own everything there. I live in Joliet now, and I'm connected with some dudes who have been there for years. And I'm seeing what black Joliet used to look like, all the business districts. A lot of people are ashamed of Joliet, but they used to be booming over there. So it's like, what happened? We gotta go back to that. So let's keep going. And I'll put that in there just so y'all can see the proof. Because sometimes people feel like I need to make up stuff, right? You know, but the proof is in the pudding. If you learn about yourself more, you do better in life. You expose yourself to who you are more, you do better in life. That's according to a hard study. And I want y'all to think about it a little bit even more. If black students do better, according to statistics and studies, if they're taught to have pride in themselves, then that means normally you're taught to have what about yourself? Doubt. Doubt. Hatred. You see what I'm saying? If, the, if, if I teach you to love yourself, which you should already, but we're not taught that, and that makes you do better, and they figure that out by a study, I could have told them that, then what that means is the school system is normally, or society normally is teaching you that you're not really worth anything. Let's take like a quick break, y'all. That's, that's all I want you to think about. I want y'all to stand up for me. Stand up for me. Yeah, stand up, stand up, stand up. And here's what I want you to think about. I want you, everybody's seen, uh, everybody seen Black Panther, right? Okay, so I'm not gonna show the clip, maybe I'll show it after, but I want you to decide between who you agree with the most between uh, T'Challa and Killmonger, all right? We, we still cool on who those people are. Kind of light here, but you know, Killmonger and T'Challa. So think about what they represented in the movie. If you more, most connect with Killmonger, I want you to go over on this side. If you most connect with T'Challa, I want you to go over on that side. And I'm gonna probably call them a couple of y'all to tell me why. So, um, Killmonger, T'Challa, based on how it is up here, basically. So move over there a little bit. Move over there a little bit for me. So we got a lot of Eric Kilmarnock fans over here. Oh, that's the dude who said hey. Okay. All right. So let me hear one person tell me why. Yes, sir. Family of 
On this side, watch the challenge. Y'all kind of light <laughs> What's up? Watch the challenge. Speak up. Yeah, go ahead. Alright, so. So, the challenge, you like, he shall be dispensed with his good people. He's saying that he acknowledged that people all around the uh, world is like in danger and trouble, but he still seems like he's the king of the most high in the world. Right. So you gotta focus on home first. Right. So he, um, he basically like just covered the basis with that. And then he like taking like so he standing for his own. Mm -hmm. Just like he standing for his own, he said, you know, what he was doing. Right, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, cool. So I'm, I'm gonna let y'all decide because some of y'all look comfortable. I don't know. You can go back to your seat if you like to, or you can stay where you went. So let y'all decide everybody was like this. So yeah, man. Everybody waiting for somebody to make the next move. <laughs> All right, so this is what we're going to do, y'all. So for the remainder of this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you and show you proof of how we need to, as black men right now in this country, consider what I showed you on the previous slide, we need to have a combination in the mind and the child. That's right. Because one thing that they actually started to say when they analyzed this film afterwards was Killmark was one of the first um, villains in a Marvel movie or superhero movie that wasn't completely a villain to people. Because when he said certain things, he was like, man, I can relate to that. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, if you look at this dude's biography, I understand why. Like, the comic book had him in Harlem, New York, but it's Brian Coogler, the black director, who really, y'all, is only like 32 years old, did Creed 2, did um, Fruitvale Station 2. He plays in Oakland, that's where he's from. Oakland, the same place where my favorite football players of all time, Marshawn Lynch, is from. The same place where, guess what was found? Black Panthers. Harlem, well, the Bronx can go to the hip hop. <laughs> right. So, so Killmonger was a part of that family, but he was transplanted to America. So he knew where he was from, but then he also had that experience of what black folks dealt with. See, T'Challa represents what we would have been in Africa had we not been touched. You see what I'm saying? But then Killmonger represents the trauma we went through coming to America. So it's like when you heard that, you're like, man, well, I, that makes sense. I connect to that. And then when he started speaking about the anger and frustration, it was relatable. It's the same thing with Malcolm and Martin. Mm -hmm. Again, I can't say who's more right. I just say a combination of both they got. They make a lot of great points. We can't just get rid of everybody. You see what I'm saying? So the first thing I want you to think about in terms of Eric Killmarker is, and I'm going to show you the scene in a second, I want you to think about that scene when he was in a museum right here. And I want you to metaphorically I want you to take back your history. You remember how that scene went? This scene, he's in a, he's in a museum, and he's looking at the artifacts, and he knows what they are. He didn't say anything. He asked the lady to come over there and explain what she talks. And he's asking her about it, she's pointing them out. And then he gets to one in particular, the vibranium, I think it was an ax or something. And he asked her, and she was kind of confused, and she kind of guessed on where it was from. And he's like, no, nah, that's from Wakanda. And he tells her, like, you know, y'all stole this action. Because when you even think about how the museums are set up, how do they get all this stuff? You know, well think about the fact that most countries across the world, we expect them to adapt to what language? English. English. That's because the English colonized most of the world. That's right. You see what I'm saying? So if it's a country where they speak English and then they have an artifact from that place, it's not likely they went there and said, I'll pay you a million dollars for it. They just came. So they went, just take it, just try to jet snatch it, right? But then the laws changed after that. That's the game, that's the landmine. So what I need you to do metaphorically is take back your artifact, take back your history. We can't start in 1619. We can't even start in 1492 with Columbus. We need to start with who we were and who were we. T'Challa and Wakanda most accurately represent the country where all human beings come from, Ethiopia. How many of y'all knew that? The earliest evidence will say Ethiopia, which is right next to the starts with the E, equator. Which means that all human beings come from that environment and people started to branch out, and as they got further away from the sun, guess what happened to their skin? 
got a little lighter, but they know. Or lost the melanin, the hair got a little straighter. That's all it is, y'all. The race thing is something we used to categorize ourselves, but we're really just children of the sun, if you think about that, metaphorically and simply well. So that's what we are. We talk in hundreds of thousands of years, and then we start to move across. We talk in not even ancient Egypt first, we talk in Ethiopia than ancient Gubia. Right here, Sudan, right? These countries that have way more pyramids there than even Egypt has. And the pyramids who people like scientists and these people can't even figure out now how to, how people ever remain. They still don't know. We talking people that have put machines in space, sent things to Mars. They're like, I don't know how a human being three, four thousand years ago put a, put a pyramid. I don't know how to get it. Matter of fact, if you haven't seen the history channel, what they say? Ancient things. I ain't keep gaming at first, to be real. I was like, I was like a good conspiracy theory. So I'm watching this, like, oh man, they probably did that. Because all the pyramids are like geographically in the shape of like, I don't know, pie, something like that. And it's almost like the black people outside of the universe, they saw it and put it in a certain spot. So they make us think that we couldn't have been smart enough to do that. So they say somebody came from another part. And then they left. We never seen it again. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not a math teacher, but I don't know how likely it is that they come by here for the one time 10,000 years ago. See, that's the history I'm talking about that we don't know about. Or all the, think about all the ancient Egyptians we have never heard about, like Agnan, right here, who was the first Egyptian pharaoh to, uh, to unite the religions under monotheism, one God. Or the wealthiest man of all time, not Bill Gates. Not Andrew Carnegie, not, not Donald Trump. Not Jeff Bezos, not even close. We talking Mount Samusa with a net worth that would probably be, if I'm not mistaken, last time I checked, 500 million in today's money. Yeah, gold there. Do you all know that Africa is the only continent that can be self-sufficient without any outside help? That means that if every country somehow got overflown, the sea levels rise, everything you need to exist is in this country. Think about America. Where do we always go to get other stuff that we don't have? The Middle East, South America, we're in Venezuela right now, and Africa. We don't hear about it a lot, because the media ain't telling us it, but we're there. We go there. There's oil you here, but not as much. Everything you need, that you need is there. Well, the mineral that's in your phone, where your phone at? You know there are little kids working in coal mines right now, taking out these minerals. Let me, let me tell you the name of this. I forgot the name of the mineral. The mineral's called it. Colton, C-O-L-T-A-N. This is a mineral that is most like vibranium. This is a mineral that is in everybody's phone that they use as slave labor to extract from the earth. You thought Wakanda and Black Panther was just a movie. They took this stuff from actual facts that are real, and then they made it into a movie for them. And then we have the Moors right here. The Moors who came from Northern and Western Africa who went to Spain. And this is when Spain and Italy, they were in the dark ages and during the plague. And when they came there, they brought libraries, y'all, hospitals. They increased the literacy rates. Black people helped build castles. We think castles, we think of like, you know, King Arthur IV or something like that. You see what I'm saying? All right, so this is what I want y'all to do too. We're gonna wrap it up in a second. The second thing I want you to do is unlock your vibranium. So now we're looking at the child. Now the child, he, see, here's the thing. Remember when you saw the clip, right? And they were uh, showing how Wakanda looked, and it looked like what they saw. They saw poverty, right? But when you get into that realm, everything opens up. So I want you to think about what that represents to us, because I feel like T'Challa had a sense of anxiety, and I think that's how a lot of us are too. Even when we in the hood, like to get something. Some people want to be flashy with it. Other people are like, I don't want nobody to know what I got. I, I don't trust them. You feel what I'm saying? Like you might be like, eh, this person might be on some dummy. They might try to rob me. I don't know if I want to show it. But here's what I need you to do. We have to get rid of that fear of saying, I don't want to help nobody else out with it. I got this focus on my own. I want you to unlock your life brain and better for it and realize that by helping somebody else, you helping yourself too. And again, I mean, this is not a shameless plug for teaching, or maybe it is. But that's how I feel as a teacher, where somebody can speak. When you lift somebody else up, you climb up too with them. Unlock your vibranium. And the thing is about this, y'all, we only have a limited amount of time here. As a matter of fact, before we even get to that, 
I want you to even think about the fact that your existence here is a miracle. I looked this up. They said that the probability for a human being to exist is one, and I'm probably going to say this wrong, one in 400 quadrillion. Yeah, that's right. That sounds like one of the things you make up, like zillion, quadrillion, four billion, four million, whatever. We don't know if we see nothing past trillion. And I know trillion because that's a day. <laughs> and that's what it looks like. Look at that. Whole money. 15 zero. So the likelihood that you will be here, you're, you're more likely to hit the lava. You're more likely to hit the fireball. So your existence in itself is actually a miracle. So now it's like, what are you going to do with that miracle? Vibranium is a miracle. It's a metal that's the most powerful in the world. If I look at you and I'm looking dead in the eye and say, you're one of the most powerful beings in the world, would you believe it? Because there are certain times in history where somebody actually felt that and they went out and acted like it. Dr. King, anybody? Malcolm X, anybody? Huey Newton, anybody? Frederick Douglass, anybody? People who stood up during slavery. Then Mark B.C., anybody? Nat Turner, anybody? Henry Box Brown, who escaped in a box to freedom. Or Robert Smalls, who freed people after he took control of the ship. So what is your vibranium? What is it that you're going to have to unlock? Matter of fact, who in here can honestly raise their hand right now and say they know what their purpose is in life? So we haven't unlocked it yet, and that's fine. I'm doing it. I didn't know either. I just knew I'm going to college. I'm going to I'm doing that. I'm going to college. Yeah, we know our next step without knowing our purpose. We know where we're going, but we don't know how we're going to get there. We don't know what we're going to do with it. And that some of us might graduate with a degree and get a job we hate. We got to find what that purpose is. And I can give you a hint. And again, studies show that you're happier when you serve somebody. So the next question for you is, what type of service do you want to provide in the world? Because anything you do in life is a service. If you work in the uh, drive through McDonald's, what are you doing? You're serving somebody. You might not be doing it with a smile, but you're serving somebody. <laughs> the same thing you do there with service is the same thing somebody else does when they clean the toilet. It's right here, providing the service. Jeff Bezos, wealthiest man in the world, providing the service. So what type of service do you want to provide? LeBron James, best basketball player in the world right now, provides the service, entertainment. And he does a whole bunch of stuff outside of that as well. Unlock your vibrating, y'all. What is it that you want to give to the world? And here's one, something else I want you to think about, too. Anybody know what a sequoia seed is? It's a sequoia seed. So there's this thing, you might want to Google this, maybe you write it down. So a sequoia seed, I'm going to pick this up right here. And it actually start off even smaller. Sequoia seed is probably about half the size of this. A sequoia seed would then grow to the largest tree in the world. But it starts off as a very small seed. Now I want you to imagine that you take that sequoia seed and you put it, you have parents that have like house plants or something like that, Put it in the pot because you think it's just a little seed and ain't gonna do too much. And you water it every day and you keep it inside of your house. What could potentially happen to that sequoia seed if you keep it in your house under those conditions? Say a little bit louder. It probably won't grow. It's not in the right environment. But if you take that same sequoia seed in that pot and put it, and they, they grow best in the, in the environment in the valley, and you put it there. What's probably gonna happen to that pot? It's gonna break, it's gonna crack, and it's gonna expand to the tallest tree in the world. See, you all are supporting the seed. Sometimes, though, we're probably not in the right environment that we should be in. And you're facing limitations. So you have to begin to place yourself with the right people in the right situation so you can grow to your maximum potential. And if you don't do that, what's going to happen is people will see you at the end of the day, and they'll see that tiny sequoia seed, and they'll just say, they want nothing anyway. You want nothing but fill in the blank, and never one of us get shot and killed. You want nothing but this, you want nothing but that. Our aim has to be to crack the pot. You have to have the audacity to be great, not to just say, I'm going to blend in with everybody else. Last point, let me show y'all something. <clears throat> You doing good on time? About five minutes? Yeah, 
I want you to think about what this means to you. This was probably the this top three most powerful scenes in the movie. I'm going to say the most powerful quote by far. Real quick, y'all, 30 seconds. What does that mean to you? Talk to somebody next to you. That last quote, matter of fact, I'll play it for you again as you talk. He offered him to come back to Wakanda. All right, y'all, so just a few more things on this last quote right here. So Kim Longer, just to kind of give you the background, um, of course, he defeated T'Challa initially, and came back, they fought again, that time he lost. And T'Challa, you know, being a person who has probably more of a conscious, more of a, of, a, of a heartfelt side, he offered to bring him back to Wakanda. And then what you saw right there in that scene, what you see in that quote, is what Killmonger said. And the quote is, bury me in the ocean with my ancestors that jumped from ships because they knew death was better than bondage. And I want to close with this because we talked about how you need to reclaim your heritage, so take back your artifacts. We talked about how, how you need to unlock your potential, unlock your vibranium, but none of that matters if you don't have the discipline to separate yourself from the pack. That's what this is. What this right here said to me is, I know who I am, I know what I stand for, I appreciate your offer, but I'm good. And the thing that's not said enough to you all is this, in order for you to be successful, it's gonna sound crazy, but in order for you to have more success in your life, you're gonna to have to say no more than yes. You have to tell people, no, I can't do that because I want to do this. It's Valentine's Day. Some of y'all get caught up with the girl, or you get caught up with your boys and what they're doing and want to brag about what you're doing with them. But the thing that's gonna take you further is saying no to temporary satisfaction because you're gonna have more success in the future by saying yes to that. I remember y'all growing up, and in my neighborhood, I was known as a young dude, I was the youngest one, and I was the one that was always hooping. I was the hoop. I had the rim in the back, I'm doing my thing, and I had a bunch of old heads that were around me that was involved in some other stuff. The thing that stopped me from getting involved with them was for one, my parents told me, that's why I told y'all to write these things down. What are your parameters? My parents told me, you're a part of this family's game. Because when my mom was growing up on the south side of 74 for Morgan, her grandfather, her father told her that you were part of the night game. So don't get with nobody else outside of that. Because if you mess with them, you got to deal with me when you come home. So when I was outside with them, I'm hearing my mom replicate what her father said to me. And I knew my father didn't play too. So I had to fear God and my mom if I did something wrong. So when them dudes would come up to me and they would offer me certain things, they would offer me to join the gang of you want to do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. My mindset was, I feel you, I see the money, but I'm honestly scared of my mom. The parameters. What are your parameters? It got to the point where I would hang around some other dudes and I'd still be with some older guys from my block and somebody say something to me. Hey, no, nah, he ain't doing that. That's the hoop. Are you hanging around people like that? Or are you even courageous enough to tell somebody, I'm good, I got something else to do? Because how many of y'all going to college next year? When you go to college and you're by yourself for the first time, that's when you have all the temptation in the world. You got your own room. You set your own schedule. Wake up when you want to. It can be a party every single day. Seriously, every single day. 
All the girls you like. What you gonna say then? What's your vision? Because I knew I couldn't do that because of what my mom said, my dad said. And I knew I had to get to college. I knew I had to make my people proud. The parameters. There was another scene in this where a Cody, a Cody I believe I was having saying her name right, and they went to go fight somebody. And she tried to blend in, right? And she had on a wig. Y'all remember that scene when she had the wig on? Okay? And then when she uh, was getting ready to fight, she threw it off because she was frustrated. I can't, I don't know how people do that, what she said. That's not her. She was caught up for that point in time to blend in with the Eurocentric standard. So are you trying to be the best black version of a white man? Why are you trying to be the best black man you can be in your life? That's something to think about. Because here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna know you're successful when you start to separate yourself and the further you get up, the less people you see that look like you. And that's a tough reality. And I'm not saying that's a good thing that you don't. I'm saying you realize that you're doing what you were intended to do. Because what they want you to do is be involved in what I showed you on that second or third slide, prison population. Just who? You know there's only 300 some basketball players right in the NBA. How many playing right now? Maybe 300, maybe 30 million. Think about that, y'all. Separate yourself. Thank y'all for listening. Appreciate it. Wow.